right, it is six o'clock. So I'm gonna get started tonight. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Catherine Horn, and I am a community affairs representative for East Bay Mud. I represent our East of the Hills uh, service area, which includes Walnut Creek. Um, so if you have any any questions or anything, I'm your go-to point person for this and any anything else of East Bay Mud related. So feel free to reach out to me and we'll be providing that information at the end. Um, so tonight we're gonna be um, talking about East Bay Mud's Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant Pre-Treatment Project, um, which we'll get into a little bit more in a bit. I just wanna go over a couple of technical reminders. So I'm gonna keep everybody muted during the presentation except for our presenters. Um, if you would like, we're gonna ha be having a question and answer session at the, at the end after the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to use the raise your hand function. Um, we'll, I'll call on people as they come in. Um, just a reminder, and, and um, Tom Borman will go over this a little bit more in detail, but this um, tonight, if you have clarifying questions or anything like that, please feel free to ask them. If you do want uh, form your, your uh, questions and comments to be included formally as part of the environmental impact report, you will need to submit them in writing. They will not be included, um, your verbal comments tonight. Um, and we'll go over how to do that at the end. <clears throat> um, I am recording this um, meeting tonight. Uh, by participating in tonight's meeting, you are agreeing to be recorded. This will be posted on the project webpage um, by the end of the day this Friday, March 18th, 2022. So um, with that, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep everybody muted except for our presenters. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Director John Coleman who will be opening up tonight's meeting. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. And good evening and welcome to our first community meeting of the Walnut Creek uh, Water Treatment Plant pre-treatment project. <clears throat> I really appreciate everybody joining the Zoom call this evening or by phone. Again, my name is John Coleman. I'm the director of EV Muds Ward 2, which includes uh, portions of Walnut Creek that are in the service area, Lafayette, Danville, Alamo, Blackhawk, and the portions of both Pleasant Hill and San Ramon as well. East Bay Mud is cel celebrating a huge anniversary next year. It's one our 100th anniversary. And it's important to look back at the last 100 years, but it's even more important to look forward to the next 100 years as we uh, plan for the future. Projects like this one we'll discuss tonight, we discuss tonight are the ones in many ways that EB Med is investing in infrastructure that will provide reliable, great tasting water into the future. Unfortunately, drought, fires, and rising temperatures are a real reality and something we need to incorporate into our planning to ensure that our customers have the great, same great tasting water that they have come to expect. The Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant pretreatment project will allow the district to treat a broader range of water quality from our existing water supply and make us more resilient against the re realities of climate change. The project will directly benefit over 500,000 customers east of the Oakland Berkeley Hills, including Walnut Creek. Tonight's meeting is the first of many opportunities to learn about the project and get feedback for the project as well. Um, before I turn it over, I'd like, I need to apologize. I have a hard stop at 7 p.m., but I will be on the call until then to listen. And in the event uh, you want to reach me, I'm going to give you my email address. It's Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, at ebmud.com. My cell phone is 510-590-0238. And um, I'm also uh, I've been very honored to represent all of you and I'm very grateful for your participation this evening and you're taking your time tonight on this important project. I'm now gonna turn this over to our project manager, Tom Boardman, who's gonna give you an overview of the project before we open it up for questions. So again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine and Director Coleman. My name is Tom Boardman and I'm the project manager for the planning phase of this project. Here's a photo of the existing Walnut Creek water treatment plant where the district plans to add the pretreatment facilities that I will explain further in this meeting. So during this meeting, I'm gonna discuss the need for the project. I'm gonna discuss what we're planning to build. I'll explain the public review process and I'll discuss how we will receive community input. During this meeting, I'll discuss the, the typical EB Mud project phases. I'll go over our project team. I'll explain where East Bay Mud gets its water. Again, I'll explain the need for the project. I'll describe what we're planning to build. Um, our team of architects will present aesthetic and landscape designs for your review. Um, I'll then go over the environmental process and EIR schedule. And at the very end, there'll be lots of time for your questions and comments. 
So EBMOD breaks its projects up into three phases, a planning phase, a design phase, and a construction phase. We are currently in the first stages of the planning phase, which started in late 2021 and will continue until 2024. The planning phase is where we develop, develop the conceptual design, conduct environmental review, and perform public outreach. After planning, we will then design the project and immediately transition into the phase one construction, which will take place from 2027 to 2030. So these are key dates. A lot of you are probably wondering, when is this gonna happen? So it's still, still out there, still five, six years out there. EBMUD is breaking up the project up into two different design and construction phases. The timing of phase two is not firmly established, but it will depend on water demands and water quality in the future. So again, my name is Tom Boardman and I'm the project manager. I'm working with Bill Majori, senior civil engineer, and David Renstrom, the division manager. All three of us work in the planning division at East Bay Mud. We're getting a lot of great help from Catherine Horn and Community Affairs and being assisted by an awesome team of consultants led by Woodard and Kern Engineering, Siegel Strain and Burks Toma Architects and RHAA Landscape Architects. So where does East Bay Mud get its water? Over 90% of East Bay's mud's water comes from the Sierra snowpack just like this. Here's a figure of Northern California. And what I'm circling here is our McCombie River watershed that is bounded by Highway 88 to the north and Highway 4 to the south. If it's a good snow year at Kirkwood and Bear Valley, it's a great water year for East Bay mud. In the spring, the snow slowly melts and drains down slope where it's collected in Party Reservoir then drains across the delta inside three large steel aqueducts to one of six water treatment plants in the Bay Area. Tonight, I'm gonna to be talking about two of them, the Lafayette water treatment plant and the Walnut Creek water treatment plant. In times of drought, East Bay Mud will pull water from the Sacramento River via the Freeport facility, which is located here. The Freeport facility pumps water into the aqueducts where it goes to the same treatment plants in the Bay Area. East Bay Mud has used the Freeport facility two times in the last 10 years due to ongoing drought in California. Here's a photo of the Walnut Creek water treatment plant where the water is treated with a gravity filtration system that is very similar to a Brita filter you might use at home. The water drains by gravity where it filters through the layers and is collected below. Here's a picture looking down on the gravity filter. Let me show you here. Where you can see the upper layer of ground charcoal which is underland, underlain by a sand layer. These filters strain out the sediment and organics in the raw water. So why are we building this project? So here's a photo of Party Reservoir under typical conditions where it collects runoff from slowly melting snow. You can see the relatively high quality baby blue water within the reservoir. Here's a photo of Party Reservoir after collecting runoff from a heavy storm. You can obviously see this really, this pea green soup looking water. Due to ongoing climate change, we're experiencing a greater frequency of heavy storms leading to more erosion and high turbidity runoff into Party Reservoir. As you would expect, this muddy water is much more challenging to treat than the cleaner water resulting from slowly melting snow. Again, I'll go back. This is what Party Reservoir looks like under typical conditions. And this is what Party Reservoir looks like after a heavy storm. This is an image I just want you to keep in your head. Here are two photos at the Walnut Creek water treatment plant showing the filters under typical conditions on the left and during a high turbidity event on the right. This muddy water slows down the gravity filtration process leading to a much lower treatment capacity. Another concern for East Bay mud is runoff from wildfire burn areas. While we haven't had a fire directly within the McCollumby River watershed yet, the recent Caldor fire in the Sierras was very concerning to East Bay mud because what's going on for them could happen to us in the future. As you would expect, the runoff from a wildfire burn area leads to lots of erosion and sediment into our reservoirs, just like the previous photo. Another big problem we're seeing more often um, are algae blooms that result from long extended periods of hot, dry weather. Algae is very difficult to treat with gravity filters and leads to taste and odor problems in drinking water. And lastly, Again, in times of drought, we pull water from the Sacramento River via our Freeport facility. The Sacramento River drains all of Northern California, not just the Sierras. So there's a wider range of water quality that results from getting water from the Sacramento River. So in summary, the Walnut Creek water treatment plant was designed to treat relatively high quality Sierra snowmelt runoff. 
Climate change has led to more frequent water quality events that slow down filtration. This project will allow EB Mud to more reliably treat a broader range of water quality from its existing water supply. And this will make EB Mud more resilient against climate change in the future. So what exactly are we planning to build? So we're gonna add pretreatment facilities at Walnut Creek that will reduce turbidity prior to the gravity filters. We're also gonna add ozone treatment to disinfect and improve the water taste and odor. We're gonna modify weir structures at the Lafayette water treatment plant to improve the hydraulics at Walnut Creek. And the phase two will allow EB Mud to treat a range of water quality up to 125 million gallons per day. And phase two will allow us to treat up to the plan capacity of the plant, which is 160 million gallons per day. So where is the Walnut Creek water treatment plant? So here it is right here. To get your bearings, if you know Walnut Creek, here's Larky Park, and here's the Lindsay Wildlife Museum where I've brought my kids many times. Um, to get there, to get to the Walnut Creek treatment plant, you get off 680, uh, you take a left on San Luis, you come down Larky Lane, and here's the plant here. So here's a schematic showing the existing water treatment process at the Walnut Creek water treatment plant, where the source water, whether it's McCollumby River water or Sacramento River water, drains through the aqueducts to the water treatment plant, where it's treated via the gravity filters, followed by chlorine disinfection, then the water is stored in a clear well prior to being pumped into the distribution system. Here's a schematic showing uh, the proposed project where we'll add ozone disinfectant to take care of taste and odor, followed by ballasted flocculation, which leads to high rate sedimentation and reduced turbidity. So what does that mean, ballasted flocculation? You can think of these as a series of, of, of baffles and uh, mixers that as the water goes through, the cleaner water um, is sent to the gravity filters and the muddier water is collected at the bottom and is sent to a facility, which I'll describe later, later called a gravity thickener. After the water goes through the filters, it will follow the same process as before with the chlorine disinfection, followed by the clear well, followed by being pumped out in the distribution system. And again, this project will allow the facility to operate at its planned capacity across a broader range of water quality. So here's a photo of the existing water treatment plant. So just get your bearings. So each one of these blue rectangles, this is the gravity filter I was talking about. These large circles are partially buried water tanks. This is the chlorine contact chamber. And this is the clear well where the water is stored before it's pumped in the distribution system. Here's a site plan showing the proposed improvements. Phase one improvements are in purple and the phase two is in blue. So here's the ballasted flocculation I was talking about. There'll be one on the north end and then one on the south end as part of phase two. So this is where the high turbidity water is removed and it drains down slope to the gravity thinkers. And I know some of you are gonna ask, why are the gravity thickeners here? They have to be down slope from where we treat the water. So this is a higher point and this is a lower point. So that's why the water goes down there. Um, ozone will take place here and here, and there will also be a secondary ozone treatment taking place over here. Um, these green circles, these will be proposed new oak trees that we're going to plant for screening of the gravity thickeners and the new um, watering building here. Um, this red dashed line, this will be a new security fence going here. And this blue dashed line, which I know many of you want to talk about, this is an existing informal trail. I'm a mountain biker, so I know what that is. This is a sort of quasi-legal trail, but I understand lots of people use it. Um, during uh, the construction process, EB Mud will evaluate rerouting this existing trail as part of the draft EIR. And I know you're gonna have lots of questions about that and we're ready to talk to you about that. So what are we doing at Lafayette? Again, to get your bearings, oh, sorry. Again, to get your bearings, Here's the Lafayette Reservoir. The water treatment plant's directly across from the reservoir off Mount Diablo Boulevard. So this site plan shows the Lafayette water treatment plant in the location of two large diameter buried aqueducts called Lafayette One and Number Two. These aqueducts are hydraulically connected to the aqueducts that are serving the Walnut Creek treatment plant. In order to move water through all the new facilities at Walnut Creek, the district needs to increase the water pressure at Lafayette by raising the weirs connected to the aqueducts. You can think of the weirs as little dams within the aqueducts, and by raising the height of the little dams by 10 feet, we can increase the water pressure by about 4 PSI to serve the Walnut Creek water treatment plant. Here's a picture of, the, of one of the existing weirs that we plan to raise in height by 10 feet. 
Next, I'm going to transition over to our architects, where Nancy Malone will discuss how the new facilities will look in the future. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Malone, and I am with Siegel and Strain Architects. With me tonight is Barbara Lundberg of RHAA Landscape Architects. Um, the upcoming slides illustrate the context in which we are designing, the materials we are proposing to use, conceptual designs of the structures that are proposed for the plant upgrade, and views of the proposed facilities from the nearby trails. Next slide. This aerial view shows the existing water treatment plant. There are a range of structures and architectural materials currently used on the site to provide for the needs of the facility. Next slide. The primary aesthetic design objective is to develop a cohesive design language that references the existing plant. The dominant features of the existing buildings include curved roofs, flat roofs with parapets, casting place concrete walls, metal louvers for required airflow, metal canopies to protect materials and equipment, metal roll-up doors, and metal windows and doors paired with um, metal door canopies. You'll see throughout the slideshow that the proposed designs utilize these same forms, materials, and colors throughout. Next slide. So back to the site plan that Tom showed um, earlier, as he mentioned, the phase one improvements are shown in purple. The phase two improvements are shown in blue. Um, and the green circles, as he mentioned, show locations of proposed tree planting. In general, our approach is to utilize the, the tree planting to screen new facilities. The site is characterized by a lot of existing trees that will screen views. And our view studies showed that there is only one location that benefits from additional tree planting to screen the new facilities. And that's the one shown here with the green circles. Tree planting is maximized at this location to screen the new gravity thickeners and related structures. And we will show you these later in two of our views. Um, the planting itself is proposed to include um, coast live oaks and valley oaks, as well as, as native hydro seed species for native understory growth. Next slide. This illustration shows the six view locations that we will show you in the coming slides. Our team walked the neighboring streets and hiked the trails in the area to select the views. These six views are the locations where the proposed improvements will have the most impact on what you see from outside the plant. You will notice that we don't have views from Alfred Al Avenue or Lucky Lane. This is because the improvements cannot be seen from those locations. So just running through the views, view one um, is uh, a view from the informal trail that goes along the fence line of the plant there. View two is a view from along the Sousa Trail. View three is a view from higher up on the Sousa Trail. View four is a view along the Yarrow Trail. View five is a view from the Briones Mount Diablo Trail. And view six is a view along Green Valley Drive. Next slide, please. So the buildings that we will show you this evening are designed to meet specific functional requirements for the water treatment plant. Uh, this first one here, the ozone generator building shown on the left with its tank enclosure on the right are proposed to be constructed of smooth and textured concrete. They will have metal louvers for airflow and sets of metal doors, roll up doors and metal canopies. These are both designed to fit uh, fit in with the character of the existing structures and materials at the plant. And you'll see a lot of similarities in other structures as we go forward tonight. The ozone generator building, that's the one on the left, is 20 feet high and the tank enclosure is 16 feet high. Next slide, please. So this is the first of the six views and for each one we're going to show you the before and after 
Each of the views is keyed in the upper uh, right-hand corner of the slide uh, as a reminder. Um, so um, this view is uh, the one taken from the informal trail right along the fence line. Next slide. And from the same view, we're showing the proposed ozone generator building and tank enclosure. And in the foreground is proposed staging area number one and, and the new fencing along the fence line there. And so we can just go back and forth for a minute so you can see the before and the after. Great. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, so these proposed canopies protect various tanks and equipment on the site. The design mimics the curved roofs of existing buildings in the central part of the plant. Each canopy is made of steel structure and gray metal roofing and sits on a concrete base. Where needed, metal guardrails are also used. The ballasted flocculation canopy on the left is approximately 25 and a half feet high at the peak. And the ozone destruct canopy on the right is 23 feet high. Next slide. This view is taken from the Sousa Trail, again, Kita on the upper right. Um, and, and from this view, you can see the upper central portion of the plant which is characterized by the exist, existing curved roofs that we are matching in, in the designs. This area is already fairly dense with development. There are a lot of buildings and treatment structures in this area. Uh, next slide. Um, the proposed structures fill into and around the existing structures and in some cases replace existing structures. So we can kind of toggle back and forth with those views. Um, but the overall effect here is that there's, um, it's, it's like infill and there's not a tremendous amount of visual change. All right, next slide. Um, this is our third view. And this view is taken higher up the Sousa Trail. You can see from here, you can see not only the upper portion of the plant that we were just looking at, but also the lower areas of the plant. Next slide. So this view is from a, a great distance as, as you can see, and the perspective shows how the new facilities are filling into the existing, making them difficult to distinguish. Okay, uh, next slide. So these are um, the structures that we will see from the trail above the northwest corner of the site. Um, the maintenance building on the left is proposed to house the consolidated maintenance facilities that are currently housed at other locations on the plant. The design combines smooth concrete walls and insulated metal clad walls, a parapet roof, as well as a curved roof, and the same family of metal doors, roll-up doors, and metal canopies that we have seen in the other designs. On the right, we have two pumping plants proposed to be constructed of smooth and textured concrete with metal louvers for airflow and sets of metal doors and metal canopies. The roofing is proposed to be gray metal on, on uh, both buildings. The maintenance building is approximately 36 feet high and the pumping plants are approximately 17 feet high. Next slide. And this view is taken from the Yarrow Trail. Um, again, you can see the upper central portion of the plant as well as the dense existing tree cover in the foreground. Next slide. Um, and in our after view here in the, in the middle ground, um, we see the two pumping plants 
sitting within the existing trees and the maintenance building is barely visible. It's very much shrouded by the existing tree cover. Uh, the gravity thickeners on the left, we'll look at in a moment in a little bit more detail. Okay, next slide. So this is um, our gravity thickener uh, facility that uh, Tom showed us in the uh, schematic. Um, in the foreground are two proposed pumping plants, the uh, little buildings, um, and they're sitting between the gravity thickeners. And behind all of that is the, de the dewatering building. Um, the gravity thickeners are sitting behind a smooth concrete wall. So there's a retaining wall um, that creates the sort of platform that they're all sitting on. The buildings are proposed to be constructed of smooth and textured concrete with metal louvers for airflow and sets of metal doors, metal windows, and metal canopies. The gravity thickeners themselves are four feet high. The retaining wall in the foreground is six feet high. The, the solids pumping plants are 18 and a half feet high, and the dewatering building in the rear is 31 and a half feet high. Next slide. This view is taken from the Mount Diablo Trail. You can look at the next slide. So right there in the middle of the image, you can see the proposed structures as well as the trees that will be planted in front of them. The trees will be planted to help screen the views of the new facilities. This view shows what the trees will look like in 20 years. Great, so on to our sixth and final view. Um, last but not least, this view is taken from Green Valley Drive. It's a very comprehensive view because of the distance that we have and it takes in the entire plant. Next slide, when you're ready. Um, so you can see from this view that the scope of the proposed improvements in the context of the large landscape view and how from this distance they're quite diminutive. And we can, yeah. All right, thank you. So that's our last of the um, design slides and I'll turn it back to Tom. Thanks a lot, Nancy, great job. Next, I'm going to go over the environmental review process and the schedule for the EIR. So what exactly is an EIR? It's an environmental impact report, and its purpose is to inform the public of potential environmental consequences resulting from projects. An EIR is required under CEQA, or the California Environmental Quality Act, when there is a potential that a project may have significant environmental impacts to the community. Based on the results of the CEQA initial study performed for this project, the following environmental categories are listed here will be reviewed as part of the EIR process. For more detailed information, please see the initial study published on the project webpage. It's roughly a 30, 40 page document that goes into a lot of detail on each of these environmental categories if you really wanna see what we're concerned about and what we plan to review. So where are we in the schedule? Uh, as I mentioned previously, we're at the beginning stages of the planning phase, which we started in fall 2021, where we're preparing, preparing conceptual site layout and architectural plans for the new buildings. On February 28th, we published the NOP. What, does that, what that means is a, it's a publication that uh, provides public notice that EB Mud is preparing an EIR for a project. And the goal of the NOP period is to receive written comments on the EIR scope over a course of 30 days. So we're in the middle of the 30 day NOP period. So here we are March 16th, having our first community meeting and we're here to receive public input on the scoping for our project. 
moving ahead uh, in the summer and fall of 2023, so roughly you know, 15, 15 months out, um, we'll be publishing the draft EIR. And that's when we'll start to hold another series of public meetings. There'll be a lot more public meetings for you to talk about our project. And we'll have more details to give you. Again, right, we're right at the beginning where it's still kind of conceptual. Um, we haven't, uh, it will be much more concrete. You know, you'll have something to comment later. Um, based on those meetings, um, we will finalize EIR in the spring and summer of 2024 um, and then pre um, present the EIR to the board for their consideration. If all is well, uh, the board will certify the EIR and we'll move right into the design phase, which should take place over the course of three years. And then we'll move immediately into the construction phase, which again, for phase one, we're expecting it to take place in year 2027 to 2030. So it's still a good five, six years out before you'll see this project happening. Um, phase two, as I mentioned uh, previously, will take place at a later date based on um, future water quality and water demands in our service area. So what are we going to do next? Uh, so we're going to continue to perform environmental studies in support of the EIR. Um, if you hang out at the site a lot, you've probably seen a lot of people rocking around, looking at things, taking pictures. And we've had a series of scientists doing geo geotechnical studies, biologic studies. Um, in the next month, you'll see people doing traffic studies in your neighborhood. You'll see people setting up noise studies. And we're basically gathering all the data that we need to perform our environmental review. We're also gonna continue outreach with stakeholder agencies on the scope of the project. Um, we're gonna consider NOP feedback for scoping the project. And again, we'll start preparing the draft environmental impact report that we plan to release in the summer or fall of 2023. So lastly, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Um, Director Coleman uh, uh, hinted at this earlier too. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I know all of you are very busy and I know there's a lot going on in the world right now that's probably a lot more important than this project, but thank you for being here and for helping us out because your comments do matter. Um, if you want more information, more technical, if you really wanna dig in and find more information, you can go to this website. Um, I've posted the initial study, the NOP, there's some site figures. And again, as Catherine mentioned, within a couple of days, um, this entire presentation will be there as a PDF. Um, I see a few of you are taking photos. You don't need to take photos. You, you, you'll have the PDF. You can do anything you want with it. And then we're also going to have a YouTube video of this entire recording. So you can listen to me talk again if you want. Um, we'll go back. Um, if, um, if you would like your comments and questions included in the draft EIR in the appendix, you need to send them to me in writing. Um, you can send them to this email address here or you can mail them via snail mail here. But again, I need them by March 30th to be included in the appendix. Um, again, if you have some questions and comments, we'll consider um, your things. But I, if you want your comments to be you know, in writing and documented, you have to put them in writing. Um, last but not least, if you just have general questions about EB mud projects, about drought, about water conservation, you can always reach out to Catherine Horn at this email address here. So next time we're going to segue into the Q&A period. I'm sure you've been all waiting for this and I will pass the mic to Catherine and she will moderate the next phase of this discussion. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Tom. So um, if you are interested, so it looks like we have a couple of hands raised. I'm going to be taking um, questions as they come, as I, as they appear to me uh, to come in. Um, so um, again, it, you know, clarifying questions, anything that you, you know, you want to discuss tonight um, is great. It, it will not be formally um, included in part of the, as part of the EIR unless you submit it in writing. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marty. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, I'm Marty Voluva. I live in the neighborhood. Um, I remember going um, through these kind of public meetings the last time around with East Bay Mud, and I appreciate you sharing the information with us. Uh, we've kind of spent a lot of time tonight on this meeting discussing covered roofs, smooth concrete walls, louver designs, and I guess my deepest concern is environmental concerns. And I don't feel like we really address those. And I apologize, I really didn't have time to read through the initial uh, documents, which I am going to do, and I will submit written comments. But I am gonna raise some questions that were raised before when East Bay Mud did another prior project um, at the Walnut Creek Treatment Plant. And um, some of the concerns that came up at that time were, the initial plan asked for some large chemical tanks to be placed on an unstable mm -hmm. ridge 
that goes just behind the homes on Alfred Avenue. Uh, the community um, read those EIR reports, um, you know, submitted their input, asked about the instability of those chemicals with a lot of chemicals in them right above the housing neighborhood. And East Bay Mud, uh, the plan was changed and that was taken off the table. So that is one of my concerns is what am I not hearing from you? And I will dig through the report, but I can tell you, I'm much more concerned about that kind of issue than I am about the smooth concrete surfaces and the louvered roofs. One more comment and then I'll let you turn it back over. Mm -hmm. Two other things that came up during that time were a very, very high security fence. And that I think was after 9-11 and we were really worried about people putting things in the water. You know, we still have those concerns, but there was a proposal for a ridiculously high security fence almost in the backyard of the people along Alfred Avenue. On top of those fences were to be a very, very loud audio alarm and flashing lights if someone tried to approach that or a deer or something else. And the community came together and said, this is unworkable. This is not a commercial environment, we live here. And the fence was lowered the lights were taken off and the audio plans for an audio alarm was taken off. So I thank you for that, but I wanna make sure that the community is vigilant and that we are informed so we can make those kind of good decisions again. Thank you for your time. No problem. Uh, great first comments, I like it. Um, so I'm a geotechnical engineer, Marty, so I understand your geotechnical and slope stability concerns. Um, yeah, there are two new small facilities going in in that area, but they're, they're at the top of the slope and they're not chemical storage facilities, but we drilled soil borings in that area uh, to alleviate not only our concerns, but maybe future concerns. And this is all something that will be included in the draft EIR and you'll get another opportunity to look at this. So um, good catch on that. Um, and then out of respect to our architects, um, the reason we spent so much time on louvered doors and smooth concrete finishes and colors and things was really to try to present to everyone that what we're trying to do with these new facilities is make them blended. And I mean, you can think of, uh, Think of the water treatment plant as a, as a subdivision and there's a few unfinished lots and we're just going to build some new houses that look just like the other houses. We're not going to, it could be a community full of blue houses and we're not going to move in and paint two houses pink. Everything's going to look the same. So that was the point of all that. If you thought it was a lot of blah, 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 but we put a lot of thought into that. Okay. Um, and then lastly, in terms of uh, um, your, your other concerns, yeah, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities for you to review things. Um, and again, um, we're going to have multiple public meetings next year, and that's when we can really dive into the details. Okay, great. So next um, is, uh, I'm showing Norm Matloff. Hi. Um, I live on Alfred, and I was here at the time uh, of the last big project with East Bay Mud across the street. Uh, and did participate in expressing our concern with all the neighbors. I found at the time, it was a long time ago, people have changed, but I found at the time that uh, I, the reaction of East Bay Mud was, was awful. It was not sympathetic at all. Uh, there was a question about, um, from us, about an alternative um, site and East Bay Mud um, admitted, I think that was uh, called Rifle Range or something, um, up above Dublin, I believe. And uh, they admitted that was an alternative site, uh, but they didn't wanna do it. Apparently it was cheaper to do it in Walnut Creek. Uh, we are ratepayers, I understand that, but um, there is an issue of safety. Uh, just to give a, a very minor example, Again, this is minor, but I think it's symbolic. Um, you know, we used to we used to um, hike up there. All right, we can still go up on Sousa if we want, uh, but we used to hike right up from from Larky, and of course that's closed now. And East Bay Mud promised that they would build an alternative um, hiking path uh, near where Larky was. As far as I know, they never did that. Uh, again, small thing, but I think it, it shows, 
it shows why I, I don't trust East Bay Mud. And of course, since that time, it's not maybe too fair to blame East Bay Mud for other utilities, but since that time, we know that PG&E has had an awful record, um, including a, a lot of people dying uh, because of their sloppiness. And again, it's a different utility, but I'm sure that PG&E, when they talk to uh, concerned citizens, they were just as smooth as you guys are. And so, you know, that doesn't help uh, give us some sense of, um, of confidence. Um, you know, I, you know we, we have the feeling that um, you can't fight City Hall, basically. Uh, East Bay Mud is just too powerful. Uh, some years after that, there was a, a plan um, from, uh, I don't remember who, it was one of the uh, cable companies or something like that, or one of the um, wireless companies wanted to make a big antenna on the land of the Catholic Church um, at the end of Alfred, Alfred. And of course the church would be paid a lot of money for that. So they weren't, um, they weren't unhappy about it, but a lot of us were. And um, just totally insensitive. Um, there were alternative uh, places they could have placed the um, antenna. It was, they agreed, it. They, they admitted that. They could have put it on top of uh, Staples or Office Max, whatever it is on North Main there at the end of um, San Luis. Um, so I, I think, you know, the bottom line is in this neighborhood, there's not a lot of trust. And I, maybe some of it or all of it is not your fault, but that's where we are. And um, I, you know, I, I just wanted to express that that's, that's how a lot of us feel. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Those are good comments, Norm. Um, uh, I'm new to this project. Uh, hopefully I can, I can build trust with you over the next couple of years. So I'll be working on this all the way through. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to take in there. Um, yeah, we're not pg and &E, and we're certainly not a cable company. Um, and as Director Coleman noted at the beginning, um, this is a project that's is bigger than all this. This is a project that serves over a half a million people. It's a big project and climate change is real. It's happening. We're seeing this over and over and over. And we need to put in a process that's gonna provide a more reliable source of drinking water for the public. So unfortunately you live by a water treatment plant um, and this is the place where, we're, where we need to make our improvements. Um, and we're gonna do what we can to try to alleviate some of your concerns and try to mitigate some of the environmental impacts resulting from our project. And when, one thing I wanted to say going back to Marty is that we're not planning to build a prison fence right on your property with speakers out. I, um, I showed real quickly another slide with fencing, but you don't have to worry about um, your concerns with an alarm. Um, Tom, would you mind, um, if anyone's interested in capturing the questions and comments um, information, uh, oh, I guess we have the raise hand, okay. Uh, could you, would you mind um, not sharing your screen anymore because I wanna make sure that our recording is capturing this conversation? Uh, sure. I, and I believe it will probably be just capturing your um, slides right now. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, and again, all the, the PDF of the slides will be avail made available. I'll put it up online tomorrow um, so that if you need anything it, to, to refer back to them, um, you can. So next um, we have Daniel Katsky. Oh, I think you're on, Daniel, you're on mute. Yeah, I need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Because we're early in the project here, my comments really are just to sort of put in your consciousness as you plan this, our concerns. We are, you know, your constituency. So that, that's my purpose of this. Yep. So, so first of all, not, notwithstanding what was said before, because we uh, weren't involved in the early phase, I want to compliment East Bay Mud actually for the way uh, you graded those tanks, Rocky and Bullwinkle, you call them, right? Uh, the way you graded them, the way you uh, planted trees, and really, like you said, you're, you, you're building a, a, a plant that you have to build, but you really mitigated a lot of the negatives. So what I'm saying basically is you have a hard act to follow as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is very important that this be done in concert with uh, nature. So uh, you've maintained our oasis of nature, but really for that reason, we're optimistic that you'll be able to do it. 
um, at this, on this phase as well. So really to maintain this oasis for humans and natures, this project needs to be as small a scale as possible. I mean, you, you just explained the half million people, we all see the climate change, but to make it as small as possible to, to still achieve the, the, the needs. And uh, to maintain the aesthetics, so really where you put these structures is paramount now. I mean, think of, of it from the point of view of the hikers, of us that live right along the project uh, and for everybody. The height of the structures is very important. I think that grading that was done on the tanks was wonderful. Uh, what was that, the um, gravity tanks that really face right down towards we are? If there could be some grading against the retaining wall, I think that would help the cause. That's one thing I saw right away. So keep in mind, three of your constituencies. One is us, the homeowners along the project. Another one is uh, all of us humans who enjoy the open space. And third, of course, the animals and plants that live in the open space. It's a, it's a big responsibility. I, I applaud you for taking it on and I really hope that uh, that can be done. So keep in mind, anything you do will be there for a long, long time. And we're looking to you to keep this area as an oasis of nature for everyone for many, many years to come. And I, I hope that was just your conscious, it'll be in your conscious every minute for the next 10 years when you're working on this project. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, so next I have Robert Simon. Yes, good evening and uh, thank you. That was excellent presentation. Uh, just to go back in some history here, I uh, just, uh, recently ended uh, six years on the board of directors of the Quail Ridge Residential Homeowner Association. We have 113 properties. Uh, many of our uh, owners remember the struggle, fight, and protests that took place to get East Bay Mud to put the uh, berms and trees and plantings to hide both the uh, large holding tank and also the tank that uh, you uh, put your chlorine in. Uh, when we moved here, there was a fence that uh, paralleled your aqueduct. I talked to Michelle Blackburn, I think is, she has retired. Yes. She had told me that uh, the fence that had been along there would remain and that the uh, trail that had purposely been built with the trees put along it parallel to the aqueduct on what would be the uh, south side, I would say, of the aqueduct was in lieu of people going up and down the roadway. The uh, fenced in area and gate at the aqueduct roadway uh, kept getting cut. I met some people from East Bay Mud out there. They assured me that they will make repairs to maintain the fence. And a week later, everything was torn out, torn down and completely removed, open wide up. There was months, if not almost a year of having to go back through emails having to bring in your chairman, uh, Mr. Coleman, having to talk to and walk through with Mr. Briggs, your plant manager. And it was uh, not one of those pleasant, enjoyable experiences that we at the association have had to do to get some type of fence and establish put up on the aqueduct. So uh, my, uh, my experiences have not been uh, very positive and the uh, Michelle Blackburn uh, apparently did not have, uh, I guess, the clout to, uh, to say what she said, but we did get all of that rectified. Uh, moving ahead to uh, present day, I still heard nothing about whether you're going to have more traffic, cars, vehicles, work equipment going up and down the dirt road aqueduct that sits on top of the two pipes. I only heard a slight mention of a relocation of the quote unquote unofficial trail that on my documents that I've sent to you that I outlined in red. <laughs> if you put these two tanks in phase one followed by the two tanks in phase two in that area, you are right up against your steep slope that provides no room for an alternate trail. So that is one question. You mentioned an alternate trail to replace the existing informal trail. 
there would not be any room, especially if you're going to do planting in that area to provide a uh, site barrier for the properties on Quailview Circle. The other question I had is I was requesting land ownership uh, the documents and still interested in seeing that. Also, uh, you stated that these uh, sedimentation tanks have to be lower than the rest of the facility for gravity flow. With, if in fact the eight foot high to, uh, concrete retaining wall, the 31 foot high building, now you're up with some almost 40 feet and I'm not sure what the grading is gonna look like in this area, but why not lower everything even further to uh, have it more in the ground as opposed to building the retaining wall and you would still have it at a lower elevation as you say you have to have for, gra for the gravity flow. Uh, also, if it's gonna take 22 years for trees to look similar to what you have given us in a photograph, which was why I was taking some pictures, uh, I don't know if I have 22 years left, but why not get some trees planted now. You have a steep slope that I don't know whether you will or won't try to tackle to pull out more land. You have an area you're gonna put trees that may or may not allow for that uh, existing path to remain. I kind of doubt it. And if it's 20 years to get trees, why not figure out where those trees can go now prior to doing the construction, give them uh, an eight or 10 year jump on uh, all of these buildings. And I think my last comment um, was about, yeah, wh wh where is this relocated trail that you were talking about? How would that fit in? Okay, great comments. And it's good. I'm glad you're paying attention to the project. Um, just your first question. No, we're not going to reroute more traffic up the gravel road next to your house. Um, there's aqueducts below there, so there won't be any. We're not bringing in construction traffic. We are not changing how our maintenance trucks come in, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, Catherine, can I share my screen? Um, I think yeah. I can answer. Of course. Um, let me see if I get this. All right. Can people see this now? Yeah. Okay, so I knew you were gonna ask these questions, Bob, so I was ready for you. So um, you asked about the property line. Um, the reason I didn't send you the drawings is for security reasons, we don't just send our drawings to anyone who asked for them. Um, you, as a former engineer, you would have to respect that. Um, but what I can show you is here's, I assume this is the subdivision you're talking about. Um, this white dash line that I'm going over, that's the, the property line for the aqueducts, okay? Um, these are those small little um, ozone pumping plants that had the little gable roof. These are the little 12 footers. These are pretty small. Um, and these are the gravity thickeners. And what I want to point out here is this distance from here to here, it's over 500 feet. It's a long ways away. I've led public meetings where I'm building a tank like 20 feet from someone's house. So I know it's your view and I know it's important to you, but it's a long way away. And that was why we included the view that the architects presented. You can tell, you can see the new gravity thickeners. You can see the dewatering building. You're right, trees are gonna take a while to grow, but it's still a long ways away and it's gonna blend in with the existing facilities behind it. Um, as an engineer, you'll probably wanna hear data. So this facility up here, the gravity fields, it's at an elevation of 385 feet. All right, pretty high. This fill pad is at 310. So it's a 75 foot difference between the gravity filters, which you can see, you can see the top of Rocky. The reason we call them Rocky and Bullwinkle, in case you care. Um, actually, I got it backwards. This is Rocky. Rocky's little and Bullwinkle's big. So this is Bullwinkle right here. Bullwinkle is at an elevation of 380. So you can see all this stuff already. Even if I made the dewatering building you know, 60 feet tall, you're still going to see this stuff. So whether it's 20 feet or 30 feet, it doesn't matter. It's going to be blending into this whole background of structures. And that's what we we're hoping to show in the presentation. And again, I know views are very subjective and it's not my neighborhood. So I'm not going to change my view. But this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it to blend in. Um, in terms of grading it, um, this is why we're going to put a, we're going to put a retaining wall to build this fill pad, but we're going to um, grade soil up against it so you can't see it. 
these gravity uh, thickeners, they're only going to stick up four feet above grade just for fall protection. They're below ground. You can think of them as um, like 80 foot diameter cone coffee filters, if that makes sense. So the sediment goes in, it spins around, the water dewaters, and then you get this condensed um, sediment that we, um, you can think of uh, using the coffee analogy. If any of you make a double espresso at home, when you're done with your double espresso and you bang out the grounds, it's gonna look like that when it's all done. So it doesn't smell as good as coffee. Um, the, we'll go back. Um, in terms of the fencing, um, we're not planning to build a new fence right up against the property line. The fence is gonna be right along here. And then I knew you were gonna ask about the trails. So here's some photos of me for scale. So here's the entrance to the, the, the famous informal trail, which goes up to the, the meadow that you're talking about. And this is what the trail looks like as you go up. And this is me standing here pointing. This is where the relocated trail will go. Can you see that? Yeah. That's what we're going to do. So we're not going to put it down in the trees. We're not going to put it here. The plan is, is that the fence line will be along here during construction and the informal trail will be along here. And then as the trail winds its way around on the other side, same thing, the trail will be here, which it's just too steep to put it down there. And plus, we don't want to take out trees to build a trail. Okay. Um, I think that's got everything. Um, is there anything I missed? Well, so my question, you're not going to be filling in on uh, where you're pointing in that picture with your left arm. No. But you're probably standing, you're only a few feet from where the concrete retaining wall is or where the base of the uh, dirt and material is going to start to slope up against the retaining wall. Mm, no, unfortunately, I don't have a photo right there by the gravity thickeners. That would have been a good one. Um, the so gravity, the gravity thickeners, thickeners are behind you in the shot that you're pointing at now? Yeah, this one, you're talking about this one right here? Yeah. And, yeah, the and, gravity uh, thickeners will be, they'll be behind me. And um, here, I'll go back. So this is, a, it's, it's sloping gently down slope here. We have to build like a level fill pad. And so we're actually gonna, we're gonna cut about five feet of soil here. And then we're gonna place about five soil, feet of soil here. And we have to build a retaining wall around these gravity thickeners to create a level pad. So where I was standing in that photo was about right here. So there'll be this new retaining wall and then there'll be the new fence as it comes on here. We're not gonna be placing fill in this canyon here. Um, so there will be room for the trail to go along here. Um, there is some flexibility on where the fence goes, but um, we can make sure that we, we're obviously not gonna put that, this fence, this figure looks a little funny. The, fig, the fence is not gonna be down in the trees. It's gonna be up on the slope because again, we don't wanna take out trees to build a fence. It just doesn't make sense. So all, the, all those buildings that you just were pointing to, that black fence that's there now will be relocated. It's not going to be in the same place that it already is. You're gonna be pushing that existing fence out. Yeah, because um, we're gonna be building two new buildings. This, this drawing's a little bit inaccurate. This, this is the dewatering building, it's now over here. But in order to build these structures here, we need to move the access road out but there's some flexibility in where exactly this goes. This is just kind of a conceptual drawing, but the goal is, is to have a fence that's not in the canyon and to have room for the informal trail when the project is all done. And then the informal trail, it's almost, you can slightly see it, I guess. I think uh, yeah. uh, where, where you have these little, uh, the, the hair, the hair that you uh, sort of looks like you grew a little toupee on top of the, the tank there. <laughs> what does that represent, the, uh, the toupee? Tell me, right oh, no, here. Up, up, uh, up by your uh, settling tanks where the retaining wall is. There's some black lines. Oh, yeah. that's fill. So yeah, we'll have to place fill in this area in order to build the wall. And this is one of the areas that our biologists were looking at in terms of trees and raptors and impacts to this area. And this may be something that changes. And this is something that jumped out to me as a geotechnical engineer. Uh, one of our speakers earlier, Marty, was talking about slope stability. And obviously that's a pretty steep slope and this is something we're gonna to have to look at, but we're on it. We're probably, I shouldn't say two steps ahead of you or maybe like one step ahead of you, but we're thinking of the same things as you because uh, we wanna make sure our project works out. Um, another informal trail, which I didn't mention is the one that runs along the fence line here. And again, we're planning to leave that open during construction behind the fence, of course. Um, we have to build some staging areas. So there may be a time where we have to either 
relocate it or, or temporarily shut it down. But the thought is, is you'll still be able to walk around the site. Um, because there's gonna be construction trucks going up and down this road, um, the residents won't be able to walk down the road like they're used to. Um, they'll have to stay off on the, uh, the dirt part of the path. But this is something we're aware of. Um, there are members on this design team that live in your neighborhood. So they've been feeding me information as well. So I, I know what you're concerned about. So that, that uh, informal trail against your fence that you were just going along. Yeah. When I uh, walked up, there seems, could that trail be relocated up the slope closer to where the dashed white line is? Uh, so we're not walking exactly along your fence, but that does make a connection back. Uh, if you want to move your pointer to the, the dash white line next yeah, yeah. to. Yeah, that's the, that's the property line. Um, unfortunately, that would, that would require removing trees and would lead to more environmental impacts. And that's something that I don't know if, uh, if well, something we would I've, do. I've walked it without hitting a tree. I've walked it uh, without uh, hitting trees to do, uh, as opposed to walking it against your fence. So um, I don't really agree that you have to remove trees to put in some kind of a trail. Trails don't have to be perfectly straight. But uh, I hear you telling me, because uh, I, I didn't get hit by any trees walking it, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I guess um, I, I would like to, I'm not going to take up any more time, but I will make up my comments, get them to you. I still would like to know why we can't get the trees planted ahead of time if we're looking at, uh, you're showing us pictures of 20 year growth that won't even get planted till 2030 or 2035. So it might be 2055 before those trees mature. Yep. Good. That's a good comment. And uh, I'll just say comment noted. And uh, again, it's something we can consider as part of the draft EIR. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about this further in, in the future. Okay, thank you. Yep. Great, thank you very much. So um, the next question I have is from Arvind. All right, uh, I'm Arvind Malia. I also live on uh, uh, Alfred Avenue. And I took the brunt of your construction and uh, back when you did the last project. And it took us quite a bit of convincing, especially when you guys were planning to build that uh, chlorine facility right on the hill behind my house. So I don't know who, which design engineer was thinking of that, you know, uh, thinking building a chlorine plant on the side of a hill. So I hope uh, nothing like that is planned. Uh, I'm sorry, I came a little late uh, into your uh, meeting here. Okay. But uh, that was, you know, it took quite a few trips to Oakland and trying to talk to your folks there to make sure that they don't put that chlorine facility right bang on the fence line on my house on Alfred Avenue. Okay. Um, so I hope nothing like that is planned. And uh, no. I don't know how many how many more trucks you're planning to bring chlorine up that hill, uh, because the chlorine comes uh, every Wednesday, I believe. And uh, the last time I was up on the hill there, uh, they had spilled the chlorine on that uh, on on the road. So if you go up that hill uh, on Larkey Avenue into your facility, you will see uh, a strip of uh, a chlorine leak and uh, the stain, uh, which is very clearly uh, you can see on the road. So that's a big concern of mine where the chlorine leak, you know, a little bit of that can leak and you can get a, another Bhopal. I don't know. I don't know if you know Bhopal in India. I know Bhopal. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. I do. Yeah. And that's when the chlorine leaked yep. and it killed thousands of people. So that's a big concern. And uh, when you bring the trucks uh, from Larkey Avenue to San Luis, it's a tight corner. Uh, so, you know, something needs to change. You know, that, that's a big concern for me. Where, and that's a, a, a main a thoroughfare for people uh, going to schools and all that, uh, you know, um, and, and uh, that, that, that's something which, uh, you know, has always been on my mind and the increased traffic uh, I had to plan my, you know, uh, taking my kids to school, uh, make sure that, you know, your trucks are not in the way. And um, so, you know, we need to make sure that the traffic which comes up and down on Larkey has to be planned and uh, the increased traffic, the noise. And then there's a staging area where you stage all your equipment, right? With the generators and all that. And that noise and dust, I tell you, you know, uh, thanks to Michelle, she came and gave me a pressure washer because uh, I had to like 
every other day I had to call you guys up to keep your dust down. And, you know, just uh, horrible, you know, I think. And uh, uh, so I hope that does not repeat again, um, which is a big concern of mine. Um, and uh, generally, you know, uh, looking at uh, the planning, I don't know what, uh, 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 as, as a designer, I'm an electrical engineer, you know, I'm surprised that uh, you guys don't have, you're putting all eggs into one basket here, into this plant. Um, and it's an earthquake zone too, right? Uh, and then you have chlorine facilities, okay? These are all, you know, <laughs> a perfect storm for a major uh, incident, which uh, I just want to alert that, uh, you know, um, given the traffic conditions, the chlorine which you'll be bringing along, uh, I don't know how much excessive chlorine you're going to be bringing uh, if you have increasing your uh, facilities in terms of uh, uh, more water, you yeah. probably have more chlorine coming too, right? So. Uh, uh, well, well, I'll start with that. Now we're, we're not increasing the capacity of the plant. So we're not, it's, um, what we're doing is we're allowing um, we're allowing the plant to operate at its its rated capacity. What's happening is though, as the muddier water comes in, we're basically, it's slowing down how much we can treat. So we won't be bringing in more clean, but I'll be honest with you, we're bringing in ozone. We're gonna be bringing, not bringing, bringing in liquid oxygen, which will then create ozone on site, uh, but it's not chlorine. So it's different, but I just wanna make sure you know that there is a new chemical coming in, or it's not a chemical, it's just, it's oxygen. And um, if you wanna know what ozone is, um, Ozone is just three oxygen molecules. I know ozone. Yeah. Okay. I just some people don't know, but it's not it's not chlorine gas that's going to kill everyone. So, um, so there's that. Um, and then in terms of traffic, we know traffic is an ongoing concern for neighbors. Um, we will perform a traffic analysis in the EIR. Um, you're going to start seeing the little traffic counters in your neighborhood because we, I mean, you know probably where the key intersections are, but we're going to document uh, the truck trips. And then um, we're going to have the contractor develop a traffic control plan that they have to imp implement during construction. Um, we will be looking at flaggers both on and off site, traffic slowing devices, et cetera. Because we know um, not only from a, um, a speed perspective, we know about the there's no sidewalks. It's really difficult to walk through there. Um, and this is something that we work with time in and time again on all our projects. Um, I just a few years ago finished up a project in the Berkeley Hills on even narrower streets and even steeper streets where we safely implemented traffic plan by, by two schools and it's doable. So um, I hear you there. Um, in terms of the dust, um, yeah, there was a lot of earthwork on that last one. You're right. I mean, given the winds, if you had an onshore breeze, it's probably gonna be blowing right towards Larky. This one, there is earthwork in the gravity thickeners, but it's not the same as the last project where we had two new con two new tanks and they regraded the whole hillside. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you, you're not gonna see dust, but I, I will tell you that there's, there's less grading than the last project. Um, unfortunately, yeah, you, you do live downhill from there. Um, and then lastly, no, we're not building a new tank or new gravity thickener or anything on that hill above your house. So that you don't need to worry about that. Um, everything is gonna be, well, as I've shown, when we're all done, um, the, 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 there'll be a, the PDF for this presentation and you can look at the site plan and see where everything is. And I think you'll have a better comfort level in terms of your house and where, where the new facilities will be located. All right, and as a, as a corporate uh, responsibility, you know, uh, you never fix the roads. You know, uh, all the traffic which went up and down on Larky, it was so horrible for a while there uh, till the you know, city came in and put new uh, asphalt. Until uh, then we had to put up with all these bumpy, you know, and then the things have broken down because of all your heavy trucks which went up and down that uh, street. Uh, so, you know, uh, I would like to remind you guys that, you know, as a corporate community responsibility, I would hope you take into account any anything you do to the roads as a yep. taxpayer, you yep. know? Yeah, no, that's that's part of the plan is the district will perform a pre-construction and a post-construction um, inspection of both San Luis and Larky Road in cooperation with the city of Walnut Creek. We've already talked to the city of Walnut Creek engineers and they're saying the same thing. So, um, you know, we don't we don't rebuild roads and the city of Walnut Creek build, rebuilds roads, but I, I know that we're, um, if there's a change in the surface of the road due to our project, then that's something that EV Mud will have to work with the city or the contract will have to work with the city to, to make repairs to the road. Yeah, just the, uh, not just the, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, um, the roads which were, um, you know, uh, hot hold, okay, because of the heavy trucks, yeah. but all the dirt which you're carrying, uh, it would uh, cake up, you know, and it would fall. And I had to call you guys all the time and, you know, ask you to clean it up, you know, but uh, so I hope, uh, you know, you take into account that. Uh, as you're taking all the dirt up and down that hill, uh, yep. you need to clean that up, you know, uh, which which uh, which was yep. not done in the last time. 
Yeah, that's something we've done, at least on some of my previous jobs where we have uh, we have street sweepers that fall behind earth moving, earth moving trucks. Because you're right, yeah, there's going to be, we're going to be hauling soil off site. And I'm not going to tell you that some soil is not going to fall out. I mean, they're supposed to be covers, but as you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen. I mean, you were there, you witness it. So yeah, there'll be something that we'll have to do. The contractor will be required to clean it up. Um, and if they're not doing their job, our construction management is supposed to be on them. And um, as a last resort, you can call Catherine and have her, you know, coordinate cleaning up the streets. So Catherine's going to be your new Michelle for this project. Uh, uh, Catherine, I already talked to her because yeah. uh, the trees behind my house and the grass, I got to call you guys all the time. <laughs> you never clean up that. Every year I got to call you guys and say, hey, come on, can you clean up your uh, mess here on the back of my fence line? And it's uh, nobody puts a fire break there. And uh, and, and we are afraid the last time there was a fire because one of the transformers blew, uh, the fire came uh, close to you know, Pleasant Hill Road, right? And uh, I hope you guys clean up that mess too with, uh, and put proper fire breaks. And I, I called Catherine one time before to make sure that they clean up all that uh, grass and all that on the hills. Okay, okay. thank you. Right. Um, okay, further? great, thank you. Thank you, so um, next we have Lila. Uh, Lila, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Lila. <laughs> Still muted. Um, I can maybe uh, ask to un so I've I've asked you to unmute that. There we go. How's that? Okay, okay good. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry for our technological ineptness. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. It was uh, very clear and very helpful to, um, in addition to reading the PDF before the uh, meeting. So thank you for that. Um, we also are long-term residents on Larky Lane. So we also had the joy of the, the trucks going up and down the street at the last one. So my concern is although there are a lot of pedestrians on this street. This is a, a much beloved walking route. And fortunately, there are more children starting to appear on our street, yep. um, but there are no sidewalks. Yep. So I, I know that East Bay Mud is not responsible for building sidewalks, but can, are you working with the city to create a safer walking route on Larky Lane? Yeah, that's something that we're going to discuss as part of the draft EIR. We're, we're already having the same conversation on how we're, how we're going to work that out in terms of the traffic control plan or who's going to take the lead. But um, we know... We know people speed down that road. It's not even just EB mud trucks, it's residents. It's a big Everybody. steep road. Yes, we know. So, and then we're gonna be adding to that traffic load. So um, yeah, it's, it's a priority for us as part of the, the, the EIR. We know it's of the environmental factors, it's in our top three and it might even be number one for this in project. In terms of putting sidewalks in? Oh no, just in terms of trying to figure out a way to, to minimize the, the traffic risk or the traffic impacts resulting from our project. You know, it can well, be done. Be... The checks going up and down Larky Lane, no matter what, right? Right, but we can change the timing. We can put in traffic slowers. We can put in flaggers. We could tell them they can't come at certain times during school. Um, I know a physical barrier is always welcome, but it's it can be tricky because um, it may help you, but the person you're putting in front of their house may not want it. It, it always gets really it gets tricky. So it's not as easy as just saying, "Yeah, we'll do it," uh, but it's something that we're talking about and taking seriously for this project. Okay. You can mute me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do. Thank you. Um, okay, so Lisa Katsky. Hi. Good Hi. Evening. Thank you for the presentation. My comments are mostly focused on some aesthetic aspects. I've already sent you an email, but I would love it if you could consider putting live roofs on top of some of your facilities. It might help um, mute the um, how it appears from up above and also help replace some of the vegetation that you'll be displacing. I think it would be a pretty aesthetic. And the second part also related to aesthetics along that trail that is behind Ramsey Circle, some of the fence lines are made of barbed wire and some of them are of split wood. And I will tell you hands down, at least in my opinion, the split wood is much more beautiful than seeing barbed wire all over the place. So hopefully you can address some of those aesthetics for the community that works there, walks behind there and uses it on a daily basis and have some aesthetic fencing and not just chain link or barbed wire. So 
So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What, what did you say about the roofs? You wanted them to be? Live roofs. Oh, you know, live. Like, oh, I mean like green roofs. Mm -hmm. Green roofs. They're, yeah, they're we've talked. We, yeah, no, I've, I've brought that up on one of my projects before. It's tough. It's, I, I know, I know there's a, uh, there's some logistical problems and maintenance problems, but uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's something we can discuss. It's something that, especially if it's a big eyesore, that's something that sure. can be placed or at least have it be solar roofs. But yeah. uh, a green roof is much more aesthetically I, yeah, I, contributes yeah. to the environment. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think you're much more likely to see solar panels than a green roof, just because there's, just from a, from a district, from a public district, it's really hard. I know, but it's not possible, but you don't want to hear that. I just, I, I have fought this fight before in another project. So, um, and in terms, of the, in terms of the fence, so in terms of the fence, um, yeah, we have the double, I know it looks like a prison fence, the double fence, because after we're, we're really concerned about people trying to break in and mess with our water treatment plant. And that's why we have that. Um, I can't commit to a wooden fence. Um, no, along the trail parts where you have the, you can walk around, you can see where the split wood is versus the, is it on the on the north end of the site or on the on the west? End? Uh, it's behind Ramsey Circle. Okay. Bob Simon knows where they are. Okay. Well, I'm I'm gonna yeah I'll I'm gonna I'll be doing a site tour soon, and so I'll go check that out. I'm not familiar with the fence you're talking about, but um yeah I agree with you. Would would looks a lot better than a prison fence. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. And uh, uh, Bob Simon. Yeah. Just to, to comment on a, a previous, you're not only gonna have more trucks during construction. At the end of construction, with putting a large maintenance facility and other equipment that needs maintenance, you're gonna have more trucks normally well beyond this project going up and down uh, Larky. Uh, is that a, a correct statement? No, um, you got that one wrong. So what we're doing is we're consolidating all the existing maintenance facilities on the site into one building. So they're going to be like happy campers all together. Right now they have their own little fiefdoms and we're going to force them to sit together. So no, we're not increasing the number of staff and the number of workers. So, I mean, it's a good comment, but no, it's it's not a new, I don't know I mean, if you live in Wall Creek, you know, we have the East Yard um, facility and we're not putting in a new East Yard. This is just a consolidated facility on site, but, but good catch. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, wonderful. Um don't have any more hands right now. Give, oh, no, okay, Sam. Yeah, just quickly. Um, we talked a lot about visual aesthetics and, and trail. How, can somebody speak to noise? I didn't have an opportunity to read the PDF, but can somebody oh, yeah. speak to noise? Yep, yeah. Um, so we, um, we're we gonna be starting our noise study in the next three weeks. Um, you might see people putting out um, um, basically microphones that are gonna pick out sound levels. And we're gonna, Try to develop a model of where um, where the noise might be the worst during construction, and maybe and consider ways to mitigate the noise during construction. Um, so yeah, so there'll be there'll definitely be. A, I'm not going to tell you you're not going to hear it. You're going to hear it. Um, and everyone's sensitivity to noise is different, but we're going to try to quantify what the noise is because that's a way we can tell you that yeah you hear it, but it's still really really low. Um, and it, after construction, and this is a big one, Sam, there will be noise from these new facilities. Um, and so we're going to try to quantify what that is. Um, it's, it's a low noise, but it's, it's different. It's new. Um, so that's something that we're, we're going to be discussing in the EIR. We'll be putting a lot of effort into it. So um, yeah, when we, we met with the city, they told us that they thought the three things people would really lock in on would be traffic, visual, and noise. And so we've hit on all three of those tonight. So you are perfectly predictable for your, your city government. So they know you well. Well, and, I, and I'll just second that. I, I think you guys are early in the, the, the process here and, and keep the residents in mind as you go forward here and the community that uses this and, and noise and continuous hum and construction noise is temporary. It's the, it's the continuous hum that will be here for the next 20, 30, 40 or 100 years as you're celebrating your 100 year anniversary that people will have to sleep with because that's the constant noise. Yep. So, okay. That, that's, that's, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Linda? Oh, I think you're on mute still. I need to do it. There we go. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, 
you know, I've lived here a long time too, but my house doesn't come right up to it. But, you know, the uh, Mount Diablo to, um, you know, a Briones to Mount Diablo trail, which is a, an official trail, you used to go through the unofficial trail that you were calling. And then they moved it and said they were going to move it back after they completed the last project. But then they didn't, uh, evidently because of 911, they kept it at the temporary um, trail. And so what's going to happen to that trail? Because it looks like it's going to interfere with it now the official Mount Diablo to uh, Brioni's trail. Yeah, we're not, yeah, we won't, we won't change that trail. You, you, the, yeah, that trail will stay in the same location. There's going to be some new facilities in that area, but we won't be putting them on the new trail. Or sorry, okay. we won't be putting them on the existing trail. Yeah. Okay, so you can the only, the only trails the only trails are going to change, um, maybe temporary and both permanent are the informal trails that sort of route their way through our property. Okay. Know, the, per the permanent trails they're they're staying exactly the same, and you can continue to use them during construction. Oh, okay, all right, that was my concern because I walk dogs up through there. Oh yeah, so, so yeah, I know that was yeah, the, yeah that'd be a major inconvenience. So yeah, yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, Let's see if we get any, any more questions tonight. So um, again, um, you know, if you do have formal comments, um, we do encourage you to submit those via email or, um, or snail mail. Um, the, both of the, the, those addresses are available on our project website, which is evmed.com slash WCTP, on the creek, Water WCWTP pre treatment, eastbaymud.com slash WCWTP pre treatment. Um, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe Tom, do you want to? Are you able to put that slide back up again so that they can have yeah, that? Of course. Just in yeah, case. Yeah. Um, so, and then for those of you who did join late, um, the a recording of tonight's meeting with Tom's presentation is going to be available on this website by end of day this Friday, the 18th. Um, and I will be posting the PDF of his PowerPoint on the website tomorrow. Um, I, I'll actually be posting it tonight, but the, someone has to approve it. So the, no one's going to be there to approve it tonight. So it will be on there tomorrow. Um, yeah, and, the, and this is, so he's got up here uh, our, the, the email address that you can send your formal written comments to and by mail. Um, and he also mentioned on our website is the initial study, which has some uh, initial analysis of some of the stuff we talked about today. Um, but we will be doing a lot more analysis in the coming um, months. And you can expect another public meeting um, next summer, fall-ish, when we get the draft EIR done. Um, but you can also reach out to us at any time. Please do submit these um, formal comments by March 30th. Is that end of day March 30th? Tom or or, or does yeah, by five, yeah by 5 p.m. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay, 5 p.m. on March 30th. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Great. Um, thank you very much to my team of people who helped me with this presentation, and thank you for showing up and spending an hour and a half with us discussing this project. Uh, again, I, I know you're all very busy. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night tonight. Thank you.